Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, for this opportunity to study your word. And uh, you teach us, you know, in your word, in the spirit of prophecy, that there's just so much more for us to learn. That sometimes we're just scratching the surface, Father. So we just pray as we go through this study today that you'll open our eyes to, uh, to just the amazing things that you want to reveal to us. And all these things we ask and thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be starting in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 is in lesson 8. So um, so this is a very, it, it, this is actually the parallel chapter to Daniel chapter 2. This is kind of, this is kind of the details. And there's a lot of interesting details in it. Sometimes we have this tendency to tuck ourselves into the past of these details. We worry all about the dates and the beasts, but we don't look at that stone cut out without hands. We don't look at that stone that became a great mountain. And those get extrapolated. They get kind of opened up more for us as we get into Daniel 7. So those are the things I wanted to hopefully focus on. So there is a, there is a couple of quotes that I have from this book, Testimony to Ministers. It's really a wonderful and telling quote just about the book of Daniel. So I've got three small quotes from the same book. And this first one says that when we as a people understand what this book means to us, and she's talking about the book of Daniel, that's kind of the context, there will be seen among us a great revival. We do not understand fully the lessons that it teaches, notwithstanding the injunction given us to search and study it. So, so what we're finding out, and this was written over a hundred years ago, that we're not fully understanding the lessons that it teaches. You know, it taught lessons to the, to the people at that time. That was a great awakening in the 1800s. That's when the scriptures started to open up again and they started seeing prophecies like this 2300 day prophecy that's in Daniel that points to the coming of Jesus, coming to fruition. So there were a lot of telling telling timelines that, that pointed to the coming of, of Jesus. And it's important for us to understand that, but there's more. There's more to the scripture than just, just, um, just the timeline. There's just so much more meat to us. So, so we're given an injunction, right, to search and to study it. And then this next quote I liked as well too. It says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, so we understand it, but the injunction here is to better understand it, okay? There's more information there that we need to dig into. It says believers will have an entirely different religious experience. So understanding Daniel further than what we've been, we've been understanding and how we've been teaching and how it's been taught is going to give us an entirely different religious experience. It says they will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart. So, so by opening our minds to what the Word of God has to say to us, right, it's, it's going to impress us about character development in our lives. Sue, you were going to say something. I, I totally agree with your last statement because mm -hmm. I was just going to say, you know, it's not just Daniel and Revelation. Right. It's anything. Every time I learn more about the Word, the better I love God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Teresa? I, I, I just wanted to expand on what she said. It's true. It does anything, every time, I should <coughs> say, that I read the Bible. Uh, like I'll go, I'll read through it, and it'll take me like almost a year, and then I'll start it all over again. And I wouldn't say it's like, wow, I didn't see that before. I saw it, but wow, I didn't understand it before, and now I'm understanding it, and now I see what he's saying up here, and now I see what he's saying back there. The time is coming when, you know, the Word of yeah. God, you know, God is wanting to open our eyes to more light and here, but we have to do something, right? We have to pick up the book, but we have to we have to also allow him to work in our lives because light. We're going to talk a little bit, but we might talk a lot about light because light is essential for the revelations here in Daniel chapter seven. So I've got one last quote here, 
And it says the book of Daniel is unsealed in the Revelation to John and carries us forward to the last scenes of this earth's history. So talking about the book of Daniel, it's carrying us not to just near the end of the last scenes of history, it's carrying us to the last scenes of history. What we're seeing is unfolding in our time. We're seeing that in the book of Daniel, or we should be searching for that in the book of Daniel. That's, that's where we need to get our understanding. And it says, I love this one, it says, those who eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God will bring from the books of Daniel and Revelation truth that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that an amazing quote? It says they will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. Start into action. So there's this, there's this, this, when we come to the Father, when we, when we partake of Jesus, when we bring him into our lives, right? That's, that's what, that's what, partaking of that flesh and drinking of that blood, right? Living his life, and he lives that in us, right? So it's through him we live that life, and truth is going to come to us, amazing truth about Daniel, more than what we're learning now. You know, it's just not all about dates and how things coincide. There's a lot deeper truths. There's deeper concepts that we need to see. Yes, Jean? Well, to go, hang on. Yes. Uh, to go back to something Pastor Tim always used to say, it's like peeling the layers of an onion. Mm. And, you know, just because you understand the top layer, doesn't mean there's not more to it. But then a lot mm. of times when you bring up stuff that's deeper, people resist it and they say, oh no, that doesn't, that's not, you know, this doesn't apply. Mm. But it does, it's just deeper. It's like um, what Jesus taught about, it's not just because they were looking at everything being judged by the outward actions. He said, no, it's the intent of the heart. If you look at a woman and you lust after her, it's just the same as if you had already committed adultery. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it's deeper. It's more layers to Deep, it. And that's, you know, like Therese was saying, that, that yeah. rereading, that rereading of Scripture, getting that Scripture again, looking at it again, God tends to open our eyes. And he opens our eyes for specific situations, not only in our lives, but in, in things that in the world that are happening. Yes, Tammy? I learned more. I read about what the truth is. I read the Bible every day. Mm. And, and that is so key, and people are not understanding that darkness cannot be revealed to us unless we have light. <laughs> unless we have light. I mean, it seems like it's such a simple no-brainer, but it's really, it's really essential. It's crucial well, for us to know that. Yes, right. Yeah. And <laughs> talking about the three angels' message. When we get to Daniel chapter 7, 13, and 14, we're going to see some amazing comparisons between the three angels' message in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. All right. Um, one of the reasons why I think he does that layer of revealing is because if he pulled up the curtain and gave you all the light at once, mm. you will be so blind, you mm. won't know anything. It will hurt you, not help you. Yeah, it would, it, yeah, you're right. It would be overwhelming. So God, God reveals us light when He, when He needs to reveal us light. So they will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. Man, that's just that's just an amazing testimony. So uh, in our memory text, our memory text is really it's it's the end. But if you understand right, Eastern Eastern writing, the Bible is an Eastern book. It's cyclic, right? We're not we don't think linearly. In the Bible, okay, the timelines are linear, right? But it goes back. What did Jesus call himself, right? The Alpha and Omega, right? He's the beginning and the end. So you can see the cycle, right? You can see the cyclicness. It's not linear. It's cyclic. It says, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve. And obey him. What's where's the great controversy here? Where's the great controversy here? Where's the settling of the great controversy here? Because we're going to look at that today too. We're going to look at the great controversy. 
because there are beasts that are going to come out of the sea that think they're great. All right? So isn't that really, in essence, the great controversy? We want to think ourselves so great that we become God, right? And these creatures really are a representation of us, of our hearts, really. I mean, we're going to see them manifested in nations, but overall it's in our hearts that these things are happening. Hi, folks. How you doing? Good. So, so uh, this is an awesome memory text um, when we look at that. This is kind of like almost the culmination, right, of the work of this great controversy. Because really, what was the great controversy? Satan wanted to be the Most High. He wanted to be God. He wanted to usurp it. But God, God promised his kingdom to the Son, right? And the Son, and the Son, because of his sacrifice here on this earth, uh, deservedly so, right, has the kingdom and the dominion. And all, all of us, we're going to serve and obey him. Why? Because of the love that he showed for us by dying on the cross. We are just going to fall in love, and hopefully we are falling in love with him day by day, right, hour by hour, minute by minute, falling in love with what the Father has done for us. So, there's this overarching theme in the Bible, that there is this chaos because of the sin problem. And this chaos, God seeks to bring into order. And we see that in the creation story, right? Genesis 1-1 starts right off with it. And it's, it's interesting when we... Um, Look at a comparison between Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2, and we can see it up here if you want. It says, Daniel chapter 2 says, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great seas. So, can you see the three key terms, night, winds, and sea, in Daniel 7 2, right? Makes sense? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you see a similarity, don't you? Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And the Spirit and winds, you know, they go hand in hand. If you read Ezekiel 37, I think it is, uh, you recall it's the dry bones story, he talks about the four winds and his Spirit, right? That's, they kind of go hand in hand. So, you see where there's this comparison. Uh, in Genesis, there was this chaos that God was seeking to bring into order. The sin problem is a chaos in our lives, is it not? If you haven't discovered that yet, maybe you need to draw near to God so you can see the true chaos that's out there. Because, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about light, the, the no-brainer light, but it's really essential in our understanding things that happen. So we can see in this comparison, right, that, that there's this kind of overarching theme of this darkness, and God is revealing light, right, for us to see what's truly out there in this world, and what's happening, the forces that are operating, those principalities and powers of darkness that are continuing to search out. So, does anybody have any questions on this or comments before I move forward? Right. So in Daniel 3, right, it moves to those four beasts, okay? And again, we're running a parallel, and I'll, and I'll put up a screen for you, but this is, Daniel 7 is a true parallel of Daniel chapter 2. It just kind of brings out some more details, some more explanation about what's going on. So it says, And the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And I want you to understand that key word there, great, Okay? because they think they're great, right? Anybody who wants to assert who God is and what God is and take his place on the throne wants to aspire to be great, right? Yes, Jeffrey? Well, by worldly standards, they were great. By worldly standards. They were great kingdoms and yeah. empires. Yeah, yeah. And what happens when man exerts his greatness? What happens? Right, it falls, doesn't it? Right. It falls. So yeah, from our from our pers you know from our perceptions, from the earthly or worldly way of looking at things, yeah, these were great kingdoms. They came, but they went, right? And truly, they thought they were establishing themselves. But remember, we read in Daniel chapter two that God's God who raises up kingdoms, right? And He is the one who sets them down. So it's God that's ultimately 
and control. So these are, are wanting to be great, and they're coming up out of the sea. They're coming out of this chaos. So you want to get this kind of creation kind of motif here that you're seeing, that there's this chaos that's coming out of the sea. But what is God trying to do? He's trying to establish order. And how does he establish order? He establishes order by bringing light, by bringing understanding to us. And that may seem like a simple point to bring forward, but we need to really have an understanding of what darkness is, and we can't understand darkness without light. And the light of God, you can see that well described in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, um, I don't know if time really permits us to look at John chapter 1, but it says that he is the light, right? And that darkness could not comprehend him, right? So as light was revealed, darkness couldn't comprehend him. But we, when we are children of the light, when we are in the light of God, right, darkness is revealed to us because the light is on. It's kind of, doesn't kind of make sense. It's kind of like a simple thing, but yet sometimes we go into, we go to our websites and we look at what this thing is happening and what the, this thing is happening with the world and we see what this person is saying and that person is saying, so we don't go to the source of light that's truly revealing the darkness that's in this world, right? Doesn't that make sense? Sometimes we just don't, we don't go to the source, the source of, of power, the source of life, the source of life, because in that light is life. So uh, just to recap Daniel 2, Daniel 2 gave us this very interesting uh, structure here, the head of gold, the chest, the belly, and the, the legs. So we see all the different irons, the feet of iron and clay. And then we, we get this that we always seem to we always seem to just not say blow off, but we kind of just kind of dust it off as okay, that's the second coming and that's it. We don't have to look at anything else here. But I think there's a lot more, a lot more things that we need to uh, look at when it comes to Daniel 2. And Daniel 7, I think, gives us the details to kind of break that down a little bit. So um, in Daniel 7. We see creatures instead of the, the metals of the different statues, right? But it's the same, it's the same countries, and of course we have our dates. And the little horn comes into the picture, and we can see that. And that stone cut without hands, it says the court sits and a judgment occurs, right? Doesn't it say that? Let's go ahead and look. Let's look there. It's, I think it's Daniel chapter 7. And, uh, and then it says after that, it says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. And then it talks, it gives a description of him. His garment was white as snow. Does everybody find that okay? Verse 9. Verse 9, okay, great. And I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Ten thousand, or a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And we see that the court was seated and the books were open. So when you see that the court is seated and books were open, you always get that connotation of judgment. And it says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain. And his body destroyed, and, and uh, the dominion was taken away, and yet there were, were others whose lives were prolonged for uh, a while. And then it says, I was watching in the night visions, and beheld one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So we see this description, right, of, of these events that are really happening in a, heaven, in a heavenly realm, right? So we see this, we see the Ancient of Days, and who is the Ancient of Days here described? Who is that? It's God, right, right, it's God. And then we see a little later on, down at the verse, it says that we see one who is like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, right? And he came to the Ancient of Days. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, it says, that all people's nations and languages should serve him. And we're going to go into that in a, in a little bit of depth 
um, just after we touch base with this. So we see this, we see this combination here, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, we have a little horn, we have this judgment that uh, occurs, and then the Son of Man is brought forth. Really, I didn't have room to write at all, but right, the Son of Man comes in a cloud, he's brought, brought to the Ancient of Days, right? And then what appears to be a coronation takes place, okay, that he is the anointed king, okay? So, so uh, this is very interesting. You read in the Spirit of Prophecy, and, and there are three, three inaugurations that occur um, for Jesus. One was at the cross, where he received an inauguration. The second one, or coronation, I think is a, is a proper term, coronation. The second one was at the second coming, and then he has a final coronation, he talks about, uh, which occurs at, at the final, the final judgment, the final disposition of the wicked, or the final judgment, at the end of the thousand years. So this is kind of, this is kind of the, the comparison together, right, of Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. So you see, you see them, um, all set here. Um, I think this all, we've seen it enough where this makes sense, right? That stone cut out where the court sits in the judgment 1844 to present occurs. Um, has anybody ever seen the illusion of the stone cut out before in the Bible? There's an illusion of the stone cut out in the Bible. It's in the book of Samuel. And it's the story of David. Do you remember when David took a census? of the, the, the children of Israel. And there was this great plague or this great destruction that was going to be coming from the Lord. That's where he was told not to number the children of Israel. I believe, yes. I believe that's what it was. Yeah. So he was told to go somewhere. He was told to go to a threshing floor. Do you remember that? He was told to go to a threshing floor. And it's interesting because in Daniel 2, don't you get the illustration of a threshing floor? Where the stone hits the great mountain and it's like chaff. All right. So um, David went to this went to this to make amends to God. Right. And he was asked to make something. He was asked to make a stone pillar. It was stones, and it says it in in the scripture. I'm sorry I didn't quote it, but I just knew our time might be short here. But you can just look for David in the census, and it tells the whole story. But he was told to take stones cut out without hands to stay a judgment. So there was a judgment motif here that was taking place. So when you see the stones cut out, and there are a few other places in scripture that kind of give kind of a similar description to it, but that's probably the most telling. So the stone cut out really talks about judgment, talks about judgment. And we see that judgment began, right? And it started with the house of God, right? In 1844, at the end of the 2300 days, we see that a judgment began, right? For God's people. All right, does that, make, does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any thoughts or questions about that? Uh, the thing about the stone. Yes. Sorry, the thing about the stones without hands, even when they made altars, he told them when they made stones, mm. they made an altar out of stone to use stones that were not touched mm. by a tool that they had, they desecrated that. So yeah. That, that was a symbolism of that stone. Yeah. Then, Yep. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's really interesting when you talk about these stones. There, there was the, uh, there was the stone that, uh, that Jacob slept on. Again, it was a stone not cut out with hands. And he had to build, he built an altar there. Do you remember what the dream was that he had? He, he had a dream that was a, about a ladder, right? And angels ascending and descending. And then when you read John chapter 1, he gives, Jesus gives the fulfillment. Right, that he was, he was the ladder, right? That the angels were ascending and descending him. So we see this stone motif as well, too. And yeah, the ancients, and you'll see this word in the in the Hebrew Bible too. It's called the Ophel. And the Ophel, the ancients really thought that you know that God, when He came down, when He came down to restore order, that there was this high point that He actually met Him. So there was like a like an earthly throne or a mountain. All right, that creation started at. All right, very interesting. And mountains always stood for kingdoms, right? It stood for power. So, so there was always that Ophel. And and when you read the Ophel, that that the temple was put at a high point in Jerusalem, that was kind of the Ophel. That was that point where they thought Jesus, or the ladder. Oh, I'm sorry. 
um, the angels would ascend and descend. And if you remember, there were two pillars at the front of the temple. It was Jacob and Boaz. You remember when uh, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? And and he was going to be taken up to the temple, right? And step off, right? And the angels are going to bring you down. That's a messianic prophecy that the Messiah was going to return and land right there at the at the opening or the the, the pillars of the ta- temple where the pillars Jacob and Boaz were. So, so it's an interesting interesting take. But the uh, yeah, the ancients um, had a very good. interesting take on, on creation and, and, and the importance of, of, of order being restored out of chaos and understanding that it's only God who can do that. Yes, Jean? And they believed that because the, uh, they, that was where the kings were anointed. Was yes, the, yeah, and we're actually going to look a little bit at that too. So they were, they were, yeah, that's why they thought that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting similarities, so maybe I'll go ahead and, and move on. So Daniel 7, chapter 13 and 14 says, I was watching the night visions and beheld one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. You know, that coming with the clouds, it's interesting when you read Psalm 68, there's, there's the scripture there that talks about the coming of the clouds and it actually directly ties it into the chariots, the, the angels or the chariots. So when Jesus says he's coming with the clouds, that, that it's this, this coming with the angels around him. Uh, there's a, the, the second coming, you know, they, they, and Mrs. White talks about that, that small cloud the size of a man's hand. I think she takes that from the Elijah the Elijah story when rain finally returned. So, yeah, very interesting. So, it says that he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Um, His domain is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So you see a lot of this dominion, 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 and kingdom, right? Um, Do you see the three things that he was given? Do you all see that? What was he given? He He was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom, right? I just want to show us, Daniel, the interpretation of this vision. Well, there's more interpretation to it, but I want to show you that, and then I want to talk a little bit about the kingship and how Jesus, his coronation is similar to the coronation that that occurred here. It says, but the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy forever, and that's Satan, that's the dominion of Satan. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, isn't that, did you guys get that? Did you see that dominion? And kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. We're going to be receiving kingship along with God? A human, a human is going to be taking the throne of the universe. Did you guys get that? Is that a little mind boggling? See, because Jesus, Jesus, when he returned to heaven, he returned, right, as a person. He had divinity, but he had humanity, just as he had here, right? But he's returning. He's returning as king. He'll be returning as king of the universe. And it says there are thrones. It talks about these thrones that are seated around. It's mind-boggling. Therese? Um, it is mind-boggling, but that was the way I understand uh, Genesis and stuff, that was God's intention from the beginning. To, to, uh, or why did he give us authority over all he created on earth? So, I mean, he... Uh, yeah, we usurped it. We gave it up. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we gave yeah, it up. We surrendered. We surrendered that dominion. Us, yeah. Which made us the most loved in all his creation, really, which will be brought up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing when you think so, about, yeah, the, so the kingship, and when we become partakers, when we become partakers of, of the divine nature, I mean, that's, it, it goes a lot further than even we can even begin to scratch the surface of and comprehend. So, sure. so I'll agree with, yeah, it's mind-boggling because we we gave it up in the beginning, and yet he's saying, "Okay, now that you understand better, mm-hmm. now that you have all you who have um, showed your love for my son, um, this is what I give you." But 
you know, the sense, the sense that's it. Back up to where you should yeah. have been. But even more so, because we were given dominion over a world. Mm -hmm. yeah. This implies a dominion over the universe. Yes. I mean, that's, that's, I, I just, I just don't get that. And, you know, um, so his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So look at this. This is great. This is the three angels message of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 compared to Daniel 7, 13. And if you'll see that, 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 you know, as we read, it says his dominion is an everlasting dominion, right? And Revelation, the three angels message just talks about the everlasting gospel. So here we see Daniel 7, 13 with Revelation 14, 6, and 7. So we see that his dominion, right? Christ's dominion is an everlasting dominion. And we see it we see it match up well with the everlasting gospel, right? All peoples, nations, and languages, right? That it is, it is, it is there. It is uh, reachable, right? He's approachable for us to receive this. And he was given dominion and glory. It says, fear God and give him glory. And it says his kingdom, right? And Isaiah 33, 22 is a very interesting one because it shows the aspects of a king. Uh, the three aspects of a king. If we want to look at that really quickly, we got like about 10 minutes left. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. It says that the Lord is our judge. It says the Lord is our lawgiver. And the Lord is our king. And it is he who will save us. So, so we see that this king, you know, it, it is also paralleling the hour of his judgment. And it says that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And what we will want to do, what we will want to do, and we're not going to be coerced to, we're not going to be forced to, is we're going to want to worship the Creator because of the relationship that we have with him. That is the relationship uh, that he wants to have with us, right? It's not, not a forced, like darkness. Darkness uses what? It uses power, it uses punishment, right? To coerce you to worship, whereas God seeks it freely. And freely, we want to give it back to him. We want to serve him in that way. So the Son of Man is given three things. He's given dominion, he's given glory, and he's given a kingdom. And in First or Second Kings, yeah, chapter 11, 12, this is a great example. And actually, you can see these examples throughout the Bible uh, about what kings received when they became king. And it says in 2 Kings 11, uh, verse 12, it says that he brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony, and then he was made king, and he was anointed. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Um, or as we've learned, right? May the king have life, right? This is really his birthday. This is the birthday of the king. He's born here on this day. So, Three things that the king receives. He receives what? A crown. He receives a testimony. And he receives an anointing. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, the copy of the law really is, is dominion. You know, I never saw this in Deuteronomy 17 before. But, you know, remember in Samuel when the people said, Let us have a king so we can be like the other nations. That, that was a prophecy that was written in Deuteronomy when, when Moses wrote that because he says, if you ever want a king and want to be like the other nations, this is what you need to do. You need to take the person that I want to and then you need to study, study Deuteronomy. In other words, you've got to take this and you've got to immerse yourself in Deuteronomy and understand the law because this is your dominion. Because really the law, you remember uh, we studied, was it last week, right? Daniel and the lion's den. What was the dominion of the Medes and Persians based on? It was the law of the Medes and the Persians. Okay, that was the dominion of the Medes and the Persians. So is the dominion when we follow God, that, we, that his dominion uh, centers around his law. And then there's this anointing that takes place. This anointing, and it's... Um, it's called a horn of a horn of oil. Um, wasn't it David? Wasn't it David that they talked about that the horn of oil and the horn is strength, right? And it's it's a kingly it's a kingly thing that's used. We hear about the little horn, right? In Daniel, we're going to understand a little bit more about him in chapter eight. But this anointing takes place where they pour the oil, 
And they would do that at the porch, the porch or the portal of the temple. And in this story, you can see that when you read all of uh, First or Second Kings chapter 11, that they talk about that. So it's very interesting. And then this kingdom, you're given a crown. And it's interesting, you know, the, the crown, I guess the, the root word is corona, so it's light. It's light, and uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, talks about the son of righteousness, his beams of, his beams of righteousness. So when he is the king, when he is our king, right, we are receiving light from him, and that light is revealing darkness, the darkness that is in our lives, as well as the darkness that is out there. But I think God is primarily focused with, what, with the light that we need shed in our hearts, right, so we can see our condition that we may go before him, right, in confession. And repentance. So I thought this was this was a very very interesting um, take. And then there's this false coronation that we see in Revelation 13. Um, you know, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. Let's go ahead and look at that. And I'm reading in the NIV. It says that men worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? And who can make war against him? So, and it goes on to talk about the beast uh, was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and he exercised authority for a time, and then he was given power to make war in verse 7. And then at the end of verse 7, it says he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So we see that this false one. And this is interesting when they use that term, who is like the beast, right? Do you remember what Michael means? Michael, who is the, the other name for Jesus? It sounds like when he's in conflict with Satan. Doesn't, doesn't that say who is like God, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. So a very similar term, but who is like the beast? So you can see this, this, false, this false growing, right, of falsehood growing up with, with rightness, with righteousness. As, as good grows, evil also grows with it. So, I think as we look at this, I don't know if you all have any questions about that, but as these, um, as these thoughts come up, we see, we see this stone cut out with hands, okay, in Daniel chapter 7, or, or I should say in Daniel chapter 2, and we see kind of the, the fulfillment of that, or the detail of that in the judgment. But we also see this coronation taking place, that Christ is coming, that he is going to be coming as king, that there's a time when he's going to be leaving his, uh, his sanctuary, he's going to be leaving that most holy place, and he's going to be coming to receive us, that where he is, there we might be also, and he'll be coming as a, as a king at that time. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word, and uh, as we continue uh, to study, we just pray that you would continue to grow our understanding of, of the time that we live in right now, and understand that your your nearness and your soon coming is is here, and um, we look so forward to it because it's not a time to fear and to dread. That when we are uh, when we are close to you, when we are rooted and grounded in you, when uh, we are grafted into that vine, which is you, Father then we know that it's going to be okay no matter what may happen, no matter what may befall us, Father. We know that you are, you are there, and you are there for us. So continue to bless us as we go through the rest of our service. In Jesus' name we pray.